In this video, we're going to discuss the normalization of the wave function. So in previous videos, we've talked about the Born interpretation of the wave function and how we um, interpret the wave function it, through this lens of probability, right? We can build up a probability density and be able to talk about the location of a particle as far as like its, its probability of being in a certain region of space. Right. So um, in order to talk about uh, things in a, in a statistical probabilistic way, uh, we have to have a normalized probability distribution. And that normalization is given by this integral shown here. So uh, basically, if we have some probability distribution P of X and we integrate over all space, so it is a one dimensional integral over X. If we integrate over all space from negative infinity to positive infinity, that integral should be equal to one. So let's try to tie this back to our physical uh, meaning here, right? So if we think about a particle, right, if we're interested in a particle um, and looking at its location, as with the Born interpretation, right, uh, this integral would be the same as saying if we look over all space, all possible regions of space, we should be able to find that particle somewhere. Right. There's a 100 percent possibility that the particle is located from negative infinity to positive infinity, that it exists somewhere in space. There's a 100 percent chance of that. So this is basically the um, this integral is basically saying our particle exists if our probability distribution is the location of the particle. Right. So how do we actually do this with our wave function? Right. Because when we get a solution to Schrodinger's equation, those wave functions are not guaranteed to give us this uh, to give us one if we integrate overall space building its probability distribution. Right. So whenever we get a solution to Schrodinger's equation, it is an unnormalized wave function. So let's say we have an unnormalized wave function. Psi of X. Right. And so to begin this conversation, we'll just start with one dimension. So let's say we have an unnormalized wave function psi of X in order to normalize it. What we do is build is uh, basically solve for a normalization constant. We introduce a normalization constant. So normalization constant. And we use a capital N to denote the normalization constant. And so what we can do here is multiply the normalization constant by the wave function. So we'll have N times psi of X. And that's that normalization factor is uh, is built up in such a way that it makes this integral true. And we'll go through an example of that. But basically what I'm saying here is that we'll take this normalization factor times the wave function. And when we solve that integral, we should get one, right? So the probability would be equal to the normalization constant squared times the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of the square of the wave function. And put psi of X squared dx, right? With the normalization factor, this should be equal to one, right? So in general, when you just get a, a general solution to Schrodinger's equation, this integral being equal to one may not be true. But with this normalization factor, the integral should be equal to one, right? So uh, so the normalization factor is introduced so that this uh, total integral over all space will be equal to one. Now you might be saying, wait, but if we multiply this number by the wave function, doesn't that change the wave function? And technically, yes, it changes the wave function, but it's actually still a valid solution to Schrodinger's equation. And I'll show that um, right now. So it's, um, even with this normalization factor, uh, the time independent Schrodinger equation would still be valid. Right. And so let me kind of show that. So if we go through our time independent Schrodinger equation, right, we have this, you know, kinetic energy term, negative H bar over two M second derivative. And what I'm going to do is plug in the normalization constant times psi of X. Right. That's now our wave function. Right. We're multiplying this wave function by this normalization constant. Right. Second derivative with respect to X. 
Then we got our potential function times the normalization function or normalization constant times the wave function is equal to E times N times the wave function, right? So now why is this still valid? Well, you see that this is just being multiplied by the wave function. It's just a constant, right? It's multiplied by that wave function. Same thing here is multiplied by the wave function. In this derivative, since n is always a constant, it's not going to have our integrating variable in it, so it wouldn't have x in it. It's just going to be a scaling factor, a constant. So it can actually be pulled out of this uh, derivative as well. And so if you, you know, factor out n on both sides, it cancels out on both sides. So th this is actually a general feature of any second order differential equation. You can scale them by a, a scalar, common scalar factor and it would still be a valid solution to that differential equation. So Schrodinger's equation is no different. You can scale it by any constant and still have a valid solution to Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so we, so we know the nuts and bolts of this now. So how do we actually solve for this normalization constant? Well, we can make explicit use of this identity. Right, the fact that we want this integral to be equal to one, once we have a solution to Schrodinger's equation, we can just use this to solve for the normalization constant. So let's let's show what that's going to look like, right? So we know n squared, and I'm doing this for one dimension, but this will easily extend to multiple dimensions as well, right? So dx should be equal to one, right? We want it to be equal to one. So what we're gonna do is isolate our normalization constant, right? So what we wanna do is divide on both sides by this integral, right? So now we'll have one over the square root of that integral. Right, psi of x squared dx. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Didn't mean to put that square root in there just yet, right? So we're just dividing by the uh, dividing by the integral here, right? Now we want to take the square root, right? So now we take the square root on both sides to isolate the normalization constant fully. So now we have one over the square root of that integral result, right? Okay, so all you have to do to get the normalization factor, once you have your wave function, your acceptable wave function solution, you'll square it, take the square modulus to get the probability density. Then you'll want to integrate that probability density over all space. And then you just take the square root of that, put it under one. That's going to be your normalization constant, right? This is how you'll solve for the normalization constant in any scenario, right? Okay. So, um, so in, in three dimensions, if we want to extend this to three dimensions, right, all we would have to do is add our, you know, dx, dy, dz, and then we would have to integrate over three different coordinates. But the solution would be exactly the same as far as how we solve for our normalization constant. So in 3D, right, we would have n squared. Well, let me give myself a little bit more space here. So n squared, right? And then we would have to do a multidimensional integral. We have to do a triple integral. We would have to integrate over x, y, and z, right? So all of these would be from negative infinity to positive infinity. So if you haven't seen, hopefully you've seen multidimensional integrals at this point, if you're rusty on them, um, make sure you uh, just look back at that. They're, they're pretty simple when you boil it down. Um, you know, most of these functions can be factored out and then you just basically solve the one dimensional integrals and multiply everything back together again. So the nuts and bolts of it is, is still very similar to 1D integrals. But now you'll have a wave function that is a function of X, Y, and Z squared dx dy dz that should be equal to one right same exact thing here right so you basically in three dimensions here 
you'll have the same normalization factor and then you that should be equal to one you solve for that integral you put it over you take the square root of it put it under one same normalization uh same nuts and bolts as far as solving for the normalization factor Okay, so now what if our uh, integral is not in Cartesian coordinates? What if it's in spherical polar coordinates? Um, it's going to be a little bit different. So keep in mind that in order to uh, convert to spherical polar coordinates, right? Our spherical polar coordinates are R, theta, and phi, right? Where R is your distance, theta is your polar angle, and phi is your azimuthal angle. Right. In order to convert from Cartesian to spherical polar coordinates, you'll need the following identities. Right. So X is going to be equal to R sine theta cosine phi. Y is going to be equal to R sine theta sine phi. And then Z is going to be equal to R cosine theta. Right. So using these identities, right, we're going to basically convert that previous integral from uh, Cartesian coordinates to spherical polar coordinates. Um, so keep in mind that these um, spherical polar coordinates have unique ranges. Right. So R. The distance, it's going to uh, vary from zero. To infinity. Right, because this distance is the distance from the origin, right? So it's not going to have any negative numbers. There's that origin as a reference point. So it's going to range from zero to infinity. Let me kind of label this as the ranges for spherical polar coordinates. The polar angle uh, ranges from zero to pi. And the azimuthal angle ranges from zero to two pi. So what do these ranges mean? These ranges become your limits of integration in this case, right? So now that we've set this up, we just do the same exact thing to set up the normalization uh, of an integral in spherical polar coordinates. So we'll have n squared, and then we'll have a triple integral, right? So for r, it's from zero to, th uh, well, let me start from phi. So for phi is zero to two pi, for theta, it's zero to pi. And then for R, it's zero to infinity, right? So then you'll have your wave function, the square of your wave function. It's going to be a function of R, theta, and phi, right? So you square that guy. And now your volume element is going to be a little bit different. It's not just going to be dr, d theta, d phi. You can go through the conversion yourself, but if you were to convert dx dy dz to spherical polar coordinates that's actually going to be r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi you can probably find this conversion online or you can work through it yourself going from Cartesians to spherical polar coordinates, but this turns into the differential volume element. So after that square of the wave function, you put R squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. So we'll look at an example of this in the next video, but it's very important that you make sure you include this entire differential volume element, right? So you must include this. If you don't, you'll get the answer wrong every single time, right? If you just have dr, d theta, d phi, you will not get the correct answer. Okay, so this should all be equal to one. Again, right, our normalization factor should turn this into a probability distribution that's normalized to one, right? So, um, so, those, so that's basically how you normalize a wave function. In the next video, we're going to go through an example of normalizing a wave function and specifically i'm going to use spherical polar coordinates i'm going to go ahead and say this now to to really you know succeed in this class and understand everything uh you're going to have to be comfortable with spherical polar coordinates they're going to be a a huge part of a lot of the problems that we investigate especially when we start talking about atoms uh, and molecules will almost start exclusively using spherical polar coordinates so make sure that you're comfortable with these before moving forward